Hi, Kennedy Center. Was that video about to start again? Cool. Uh, hello, my name is Sam, and I'm going to be your MC tonight. Super thrilled to be here. I mean, you all are here for Apex AAPI Voices, right? Okay. I mean, we got Dear Evan Hansen things, and I'm like, if you're here for that, wrong. <laughs> all right, uh, so we are APAC, which stands for Asian Pacifica Arts Collective. Every year we put on a special storytelling slam with a different theme. We've done this for three years. The past two years have been online, so it is so lovely to see your eyes. <laughs> But so uh, the past two years, we have just been on doing it on Zoom. I've been hosting it from my bedroom, like roommates hold up in their rooms, me like everyone just like stay off the internet, like do not touch that broadband. We are doing this for the Asian community. And it's so exciting to be here at the Kennedy Center. Also, <laughs> hi internet. Cool, um, so what's gonna be really important and the beautiful thing about this being a live people in here, we can actually hear your responses, is to just give us a lot of energy, give us a lot of reactions. I am not telling a story. My only job tonight is to introduce our wonderful storytellers who are gonna be sharing their original pieces and to like get you pumped up. Is that okay? Okay. Also, like, I have some weird asks that I'm gonna ask you, like, throughout the night, and I would just love if you obliged. You don't, it doesn't require movement at all. It's just, you'll see, you'll see. Okay. All right. So, are you ready for our first performer? Uh, so, Kyoshin Kong is going to be our first performer. Kyoshin is an actress, writer, and creator. In 2020, she participated in APAC's Too Much, Not Enough blog series and AAPI Voices All-American Asian Storytelling event. She likes to work on various creative projects, including writing children's stories and stories about her upbringing and creating short films based on everyday life. Her original piece tonight is called Scrambled Eggs. Here's where the ass comes in. I want you all to just chant eggs, and I want Kyoshin to just come out to a crowd at the Kennedy Center chanting eggs. Can we do that? All right, ready? Three, two, one. Eggs, 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 eggs. eggs. Eggs, 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 eggs. Give it up for Kyoshin. Thank you. I did not know she was going to do that. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to start off and talk about a different food group. Um, did anyone else grow up on cereal and milk for breakfast? All right. Several, several. Okay. Now, um, how about every single morning? That's all you ate, cereal and milk for breakfast. Oh, okay, great. There was like about seven, eight, yeah. Okay, did anyone else grow up eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, like 14, 15. Okay, but how about every single day, that's all your parents made for you for lunch to go, when you go to school? Yes! <laughs> Two people, yes! Okay, great. You're, you're going to be my, um, yeah, <laughs> I'll be looking over there. Well, that was me growing up. Um, cereal and milk was my breakfast staple, and PB&J PB sandwiches were my lunch staple. I best remember these breakfast and lunch staples when I was in middle school. In the 90s, living in a predominantly white Midwest suburb outside of Detroit, Michigan. My family recently moved from a two-bedroom apartment to a three-bedroom townhome with a basement, a second floor, and a small backdoor patio. 
As soon as you walked in the door, the kitchen was on the left. It was a small square-shaped room that fit a small square-shaped kitchen table and two chairs. This table stocked all of my favorite sugary cereals like Lucky Charms, Pops, yeah? <laughs> uh, Fruit Loops, Apple Jacks, Frosted Flakes, because they're great. As I sat at the kitchen table, reading the cereal box and eating my fun, colorful cereal before school, my skinny, sleep-deprived dad on his morning autopilot routine would sit next to me in the other chair and toast two slices of bread and slather them in Jif peanut butter and Smucker's jam for my lunch. My dad's demeanor was gentle and sincere. He was a devout man of few words, but he played with me and my little sister, took us out on adventurous vacations when he could and tried to teach us the Korean language. At breakfast, he would occasionally ask me how I, I'm doing and how school is going, to which I would respond, good, and move on. I didn't know what else to say. Just like my immigrant parents, I was in survival mode, aka don't stir any trouble, aka work hard and keep your head down. I also didn't know how to communicate my feelings and talk about myself. I just floated and did what my parents said to do. Do you want one sandwich or two, he'd ask in Korean. I remembered asking for two, always. I always had a big appetite, especially by lunchtime. In middle school, I mostly hung out with the other Asian kids at my school because, well, there was this natural ease of familiarity and unspoken understanding with them. Individually, we were probably very different, coming from very different families, but there was a bond between us in a, because we were the bond of being Asians in a predominantly white school that brought us together. We helped each other feel, feel belonged and included while trying to navigate and figure out how we fit into the all-American fabric that surrounded us socially and academically. We were preteens. We had notebooks decorated in Sanrio stickers where we wrote notes to each other and secretly passed the notebook to the next friend. We wrote in code, AKA Pig Latin. Anybody remember that? Pig Latin? Yeah! <laughs> I wonder if it's still around. <laughs> um, and mainly talked about our crushes who had code names, of course, so that no one outside of our group would know who we were talking about. One day, I slept over my Chinese-American friend's house. Thinking back, I can't believe this even happened because my overprotective parents would never let me sleep over anyone's house. Maybe my parents were willing to try it this time because my friend was Asian after all. And again, there's that immediate trust in the familiar, especially when you are living in a town where everything and everyone around you is unfamiliar. My friend's house was humongous. I couldn't believe my friend lived in what seemed to me at the time a mansion. My family was used to living in apartments and now a townhome, but not in this huge, brand spanking, newly built brick home with a large chandelier at the top, like in the front entrance, like those up there. I've only seen white families live in these kind of homes, but Asian families live in them too? <sighs> I didn't give it much thought. My friend and I got busy playing normal kid stuff, probably talking about boys, and then we went to bed. I woke up the next morning in her huge house. Their shiny white tiled floors were glistening in the morning sun that streamed through their big fancy windows. Together, my friend and I headed downstairs to the kitchen for breakfast, walking down their curved staircase that connected to the main entrance. I assumed we would be having cereal and milk for breakfast. As we walked into the sizable kitchen located in the back of the house with more countertop space than I've ever seen in my short life, my friend's dad stood in the kitchen with his back to us. I was in shock to see an adult home during the day. Both of my parents were always at work. Did my friend's dad not go to work that day? Did he like take it off to watch us? Like what was his job? Did he not own a small business like my parents did? A business that demanded all of their time and energy? 
then I saw him stirring something on the stove. This was the strangest sight to me. An Asian man was cooking in the kitchen? I didn't know men cooked. I've only seen women cook hot meals in the kitchen. Again, I, this is just adding on to my confusion. Good morning, girls. Do you want eggs for breakfast? He asked in perfect English, no accent, in a very calm manner with a big smile on his panda bear face. Is scrambled okay? I was in shock and in another world. The only time I would get to eat scrambled eggs was during my family's occasional visits to the then popular American diner called Denny's. Every, anyone remember Denny's? Yes, okay, like eight people. <laughs> yes, it's still around, by the way. Um, my parents never had time to make scrambled eggs for breakfast because they worked seven days a week from early morning to late evening. Meals had to be made quickly and efficiently. And also, every day my family just felt hectic and scrambled. My parents were always busy and on the go, so my sister and I took, often took care of ourselves. And so there was this man who looked like me, tanned, black eyes, brown, brown, uh, brown eyes, black hair, in a relaxed demeanor, speaking excellent English, home on a weekend, and acting so American. Okay, so the big house, the man cooking, the Asian person speaking excellent English, and a hot breakfast? I entered a world that I did not know existed. I didn't know you could make eggs at home. Um, so I tried to hide my shock and just nodded, yes, in excitement. I love scrambled eggs, especially with ketchup. He brought me my plate. I looked at it. The eggs looked fluffy, just like the way they made them at Denny's. Wow, I was impressed. I asked for ketchup and dug into a hot homemade American meal for breakfast. And that, my friends, was the first time I had homemade scrambled eggs. It wasn't until, yay, yay, I did it, I got it. <laughs> um, I wasn't in, it wasn't until I was in high school when my family moved into a one and a half story home with a kitchen twice the size of the one in our town home. And it wasn't until I, after I graduated from college when both of my parents didn't have to rush out the door to go to work every morning. I remember one morning, post-college, waking up in my parents' home and walking downstairs to their marble tile main entrance and living room wood floors. My dad went to work early that day, but my mom had the morning off. With her short brown dyed hair and wearing her long black house dress with white flowers on it, she sat in the kitchen at our four-seat table. Like most Asian moms who show their love through food, um, she asked me r right away if I was hungry. I don't normally eat breakfast, so I just shrugged, maybe. Then she walked over to the stove and she showed me something she made. I was expecting some kind of stir fry or heated up leftovers, but it was eggs. Sunny side up. Oh my gosh, I was in shock. My super traditional, conservative, and hard-headed Korean mom was acting so American. When did she learn to make eggs for breakfast? Like, how did she learn about this? Like, what is the process and the steps that got us to this moment? I stared at the eggs in the frying pan, both super perplexed and pleasantly surprised. It's not like my mom didn't, I mean, it's not like my mom didn't shop at American grocery stores. Our fridge would have bread, yogurt, milk, fruit juices, and my parents owned a bagel shop at one point, so there was a time when all our family ate for breakfast and lunch were bagels. But there was something different about this moment, about these eggs. For a flash of a second, I didn't recognize the woman before me. The same disorienting feeling that I had when I was served my first homemade scrambled eggs overcame me. I remember, I remember asking, oh, you make eggs now? When did this happen? She just went on about how easy they're, they are to make, how they're healthy for you, and how she likes to make them scrambled and sunny side up, but particularly over medium.
To this day, it always surprises me when my mom makes eggs for breakfast. But the once, once perplexing feeling is now replaced with a deep sense of pride. It feels like we made it. My parents never had time to cook in the morning. And then after over a decade of working their butts off, my mom was finally able to take it easy and have the mornings off on some days. Then on one of those mornings, she cooked something for breakfast that felt to me like a special treat, something you only get to enjoy at an American diner. I was proud of my parents for working so hard for decades in a country where they didn't speak the language or understand the culture and still moved our family from rundown apartments to cleaner apartments to a town home and then a standalone house. A house like the one that my middle school's parents owned. These eggs represented to me the culmination of all of my parents' backbreaking work and sacrifices that led them to the luxury and privilege of cooking eggs in the morning. Now when I see my mom's morning eggs in a hot pan on top of the kitchen stove, I see progress and upgrade. My parents are still <laughs> very 80s traditional Korean, lifestyle conservative and English limited, and we don't always get along. But I couldn't be prouder to be raised by one of the most relentless, hardworking, and resilient parents in the world. Thank you. Yeah, do it up for Kyoshin. Oh my God, our audience grew. You love to see it. Also, you love the glow up from cereal to breakfast with some like family stuff in the background. So I realized that I didn't tell you what the theme of this year's AAPI Voices is. Does anyone know? Not food, not food. And actually, I am going to withhold this information to the very end. So you're going to have to stick around till 7 p.m. And just so you know, we have a we have a hard out at 7 p.m. Like we gotta like run for the doors like 7 p.m. Um, but yeah, so first story was called scrambled eggs, and the theme is not. Asian, like yes, we're all Asian. Yes, we are celebrating our Asian heritage, but there's, there's a broader specific theme, so pay attention. Our second performer is Nbi. Nbi is a musician, actor, and artistic performer. Through music, they sing of Han as their diaspora blues. Born in Koreatown, Los Angeles, but calling Baltimore their home, they explore the dissonance between the pain of diaspora dysphoria through their music. Their inspiration comes from ancestral and traditional Korean music, rhythm and blues music of the black diaspora, as well as Korean tunes their dad loudly sung on family road trips. They have performed on stages in Baltimore, Maryland, including Creative Alliance, The Crown, Metro Gallery, Wind Up Space, and the Kennedy Center. Uh, okay, so my next ask, it's really stupid and it's not going to work, but I just, I just want to do it anyway. Okay, so their name is Nbi, and they are going to perform a spoken poem called But a Ma, and then perform an original song, Great Expectations. So their name is Nbi, and I want us all to go Mmbi. Can we try that? Like now? <laughs> Mmbi. Okay. I was not sure because of the masks if it was going to be like swallowed, but like pretty good. Okay. All right, get out of here, Mmbi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Envy. I go by they and he pronouns. Can, uh, can we all say thank you? Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being you today. Um, 
every time I perform, I make the point that whatever we do, whoever we are, whoever we're becoming, uh, we are completing the dreams of our ancestors. The spoken word piece is an intimate monologue within a dialogue between a Korean American child and their mother in discussion of police and state violence against BIPOC people, black indigenous people of color, and differences of racialization in the midst of a broken immigration system and illusion of the American dream. I'm realizing that the deepest love, sometimes the deepest love is always profound because of the sacrifices we make, because of the really hard discussions we have to have. Uh, sometimes love and love for community looks like struggling with those who you love through intimate and challenging conversations to find deeper mutual understanding. And this is, this uh, poem is called But Amma, But Mother. But Amma, I'm confused and hurting. But Amma, my friends, families, community are hurting. But Amma, I know that you work 16 hours a day. But Amma, I do, I do feel grateful for you. But Amma, Samuel Undong, Korean independence would not have happened without unrest and resistance. But Amma, why would people want to destroy their own neighborhood? Because people are angry, because we are not protected. But Amma, the police never protected us during the LA Pokdong. They were in rich white Beverly Hills. They were not in Koreatown. But Amma, Yu Guan Sun would not have started a revolution if she kept her head down during the occupation. But Amma, why? But Amma, dad almost got shot in the face by military for student demonstrations against a brutal dictator. But Amma, that's what my black friends and community may face every day in the streets. My friends and my community. But Amma, I'm hurting. My friends are hurting. But Amma, you know how this feels. Why can't you hurt with me? But Amma, the US military did not only feed you Hershey's chocolate kisses when you were starving as a child, they served you military propaganda. But Amma, Black people have been working hard building the foundations of this country since slavery, since being enslaved. But Amma, one black president does not erase that history. But Amma, how can I translate all of this? But Amma, I love you. You love me. I love my community. I love my friends. But Amma, my friends' life is important. My life is important. The lives of my friends are important, and Black lives matter. Thank you. Thank you for sitting through that. Thank you for mm, being with everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening, for being here, for being your whole selves. You showed up for community. You showed up for uh, your friends and community. Uh, so uh, this last song is called Great Expectations. And this is about the hard work we have to go through to prove that we exist, that we belong here. No matter what I 
what I say I do. do Breaking my grounds, speaking my truth Is it enough for you? Getting it twisted oh. Oh, high expectations double after one another Are you waiting to lift me up or knock me down? Whoa. Unapologetically, you genetically, you experimentally, you Oh, oh, oh Whoa. Hey, speaking the truth is rooted in you, your answers are too Unapologetically, you genetically, you experimentally, you oh, oh. Ah. Seeking the truth is rooted in you, your answers is too oh, 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 hey. oh, oh, oh. Try to pit myself against myself Against my people, against my wealth I'm not the shit people I'm not the your power I'm wanting more and more for the family But pour us the trauma my war. Starvation tore us apart Can you hear this? Uh, hey, hey Whoa. Unapologetically, you genetically, you experimentally, you Oh, oh, oh Whoa. Hey, seeking the truth is rooted in you Your answers is too Oh, 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 oh. Thank you so much for this stage. It means so much. Remember, no matter who you are, who you're becoming, you are completing the dreams of your ancestors. Thank you so much. My name is Inbi. You can check my music out on Spotify. I'm on Instagram, enb.kim. Thank you. Yeah, one more time for Inbi. So they are actually heading back to Baltimore right now to be in four 10-minute plays. Good luck. <laughs> good luck with the traffic and good, li good luck tonight, NB. Uh, oh, such inspirational words and I'm just coming out here just like, yeah, let's make some noise. Uh, uh, so this next performer is Rebecca Kaiser. Rebecca Kaiser is an actor and singer based in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Previous works include White Pearl at Studio Theater, The Ballad of Mulan at Imagination Stage, and Man of God at Strand Theater Company. She also has narrated two audio books with Benstown Radio. She's very excited for all of the stories being told tonight. Her story is called Choose to Be, um, my ask for you. Also, just like thank you, by the way, for being such good sports. You make it super fun to be out here. Also, you're just a very attractive crowd from what I can see, like from here to here. Like, very attractive crowd. Like, give it up for yourselves. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, I am withholding the theme but I will tell you our 2020 AAPI Voices theme, which was All American Asians. And that might help you as the evening goes on. So this next ask, okay, let's do, let's just be babies for a second. Is that cool? If we could just be babies, if we could just be like, wah, you know, just like, Yes, yes, just like, you know, just like growing up, sometimes you can lose touch with that playful nature that you have. So just here in, here in the safety and the sanctity of the Kennedy Center, can we all just go, wah, wah, wah. I love it, give it up for Rebecca. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I didn't know she was going to do that either. So that made me smile before it came on. I was 
I'm real nervous, but that made me smile. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, so a bit of background for my story. Um, I'm adopted from China. I was adopted when I was about seven months old, um, and I basically lived in the Washington, D.C. area my whole life. I grew up in Manassas, Virginia. So that's just kind of where it all begins. Um, growing up, I didn't really think a whole lot about being adopted from China. My parents never hid it from me. I have a younger sister as well who is also adopted. We are not from the same family. Um, but it was something my parents always encouraged us to learn more about, learn about our culture, learn about we were, where we were from. And looking back now, I didn't realize it at the time, but being an adopted Chinese American really impacted um, my experiences growing up and have lasting impacts um, on me to this day. So when I was el in elementary school, I remember we had to do a project on our ancestry. I didn't know what that was. I was like seven or eight at the time, but all I knew I had to do was go home and ask my parents, hey, where are our ancestors from? So I did, and we ended up creating this family tree, and on it, it had flags from countries like England, Germany, and like all these other European countries. It might have had the Chinese flag on it, I cannot remember, and I don't know if at the time my teacher knew I was adopted, um, but she might have been very confused. There is this child in her class who is, there's this Asian child in her class, and she's saying that her ancestors are from all over Europe, which, yeah. Um, looking back on it now, I'm like, okay, that must have been a very strange experience for her. Um, and then later in my early 20s, I took a 23andMe Ancestry DNA test, and I found out that I am 99.8% Han Chinese and possibly 0.02% Taiwanese. So I thought about that when I was creating this story, and I was like, wow, that was just completely off. Um, then, when I got a little bit older, I was in middle school, I became more consciously aware that being Asian American automatically put me into certain groups. And I think this was around the time when we all just become more consciously aware of the world around us, of what is going on and how other people are thinking and perceive us. Um, people would assume things based off of stereotypes about me, like that I was really good at math when I have never been good at math and it is still my worst subject. Um, my friends at the time, one of whom I am still very good friends with to this day, uh, would call me Twinkie or Banana. And simply for the fact that I felt white on the inside and yellow on the outside. That was exactly how I felt when I was at that age. And then, as I got older, things still happened to me that I know are because of the first thing that when others see me, they see me as an Asian American. A few years ago, I was walking around on my lunch break and these two older Asian women came up to me and they just started speaking to me in what I assume was Mandarin. And I do not speak that. So they were just talking to me and I just stood there and I had this very confused look on my face. They eventually realized I could not understand them and I couldn't help them. Then they ended up walking away and after they left, I almost felt guilty about not being able to understand them or help them. I felt like I should have been able to understand them. I should have been able to help them. And then I was like, well, wh why am I feeling this way? They made an assumption about me. Um, People will sometimes ask me where I am from, and they don't seem to be happy with Manassas, Virginia. I've noticed this a lot, especially when I am talking with people who are older than me, and sometimes um, I'll just preface it with, oh, well, I'm adopted from China, to just stop all the questions that I know that are gonna come, because I really don't wanna deal with those questions. Like, I just, it's not something that anyone else in my friend group gets asked, so I don't wanna have to answer them either. Uh, during the pandemic, that was when all of the reports of the hate crimes against Asian Americans started coming out. They started becoming more widespread, um, more media attention was on it. And I got angry every time I saw those articles. And 
I had this thought in the back of my head that maybe I wasn't getting angry enough at what was going on. Uh, I wanted to do something, but I felt complicit about taking any action. It, it was almost like I didn't feel that it was my place to fight back against the racism that Asian Americans were experiencing because it like didn't really concern me, but it did. And then I realized that this was something that was always going to affect me because even though I saw myself first as white, the world sees me first as Asian. Um, the pandemic and then the Atlanta spa shootings were the first time in my life that I really felt like being an Asian American in the United States could hurt me in some way. I felt like I was having a lot of feelings at the time, as I'm sure everyone was, but I also felt like I couldn't really talk to anyone about it. Um, my parents, my family members, my really good friends, the ones who I know I could talk to about stuff like this were mostly, mostly white. Um, and I knew that they would listen and they would hear my concerns and hear my fears, but I also knew there was a part of me that knew they would never actually understand what I was feeling at that time. Um, and then I realized that all of my life I had been looking through a white lens at the world, but now, in this time period, here forces me to look through the world um, through an Asian lens. Sometimes I feel like I am stuck in the middle. On the outside, I am Chinese American, and now I'm aware that that is the first thing people see me as, and that is sort of where their mind goes. Um, you know, my, um, and yeah, so that's um, how people see me as. Sometimes when my family and I go out to dinner, uh, my two parents are both white, my sister and I um, were both Chinese, Sometimes people don't assume we're a family because we've had waiters ask us at the end of our meals if we wanted to split the check between my parents and me and my sister. And that goes to say that on the inside, I do feel white. And I don't know how else to describe it, but I don't have any real connection to China. My parents did a lot to make sure my sister and I learned what we could. We were in Mandarin classes. Um, we were reading books growing up about China, but other than Chinese New Year and knowing why we put money in red envelopes, I know nothing about this culture and I don't really have a cultural connection to it. Identity has never been something I think I ever struggled with, but did start questioning a lot during the pandemic. I never asked my sister her thoughts on it. Um, we never really talked about it. We never really have but I can tell that she is also figuring it out for herself. There's often this feeling of, among adoptees, that we should be lucky to have this life that we do in America, given what could have been our lives if we were in China. Um, we, we were orphans, we were the result of the one-child policy that was implemented, and we should have this feeling of gratefulness for being here, and we do, but it's a lot more complicated than just that. Uh, it feels just complicated wanting to learn about China and see it in this positive light, especially where we live in the DC area and in recent news, it hasn't really been portrayed in a positive light in the news, like at least politically. I want to learn more about where I'm from and I want to know all of this stuff, but I feel like I'm stuck. Part of me doesn't feel like I'm allowed to be part of this culture because I know nothing about it. I mean, what do I really know? Like, where do I even start? What do I do next? What's the next step? Then I realize that this is a decision that no one else can make for me where I go from here. I have to choose for myself, and for the longest time I thought I had to choose between one or the other, and then I realized that I don't have to choose, and I can instead decide to embrace being a Chinese American adoptee. Thank you. Yeah, Rebecca! Um, okay.
Okay, so I told you 2020 AAPI Voices theme was. Yeah, critical listening skills. Uh, 2021 was crossing borders. And uh, this one is going to tell you after this last performer. So uh, sadly, this is our last performer of the night, but it is a real treat. What's super exciting is she is a stand-up comedian, and her kids are going to watch her for the first time tonight because uh, it's a clean act. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. All right. Devine Kerr. Devine Kerr is a trilingual, uh, she will be performing this in English, a trilingual stand-up comedian and multidisciplinary artist. Her art emerges from thought-provoking jokes, left-field concepts, and unique storytelling that bridges culture, comedy, music, and storytelling. She headlines throughout the DC area and also performs as a feature comedian in comedy clubs and festivals from New York City to LA and Montreal, Canada. Her credits include International Lady Laughs Comedy Festival, being a Moth Story Slam winner, Funny Bones, Comedy Nest, and Amazon Prime. So before she comes out, two asks. Okay, the first one is kind of just like, you guys have been like such a great audience. She's a stand-up comedian. They love laughs. I feel like we are at a point in the program where like, we're warm, right? Like, do you guys feel warm? So warm? Heck yeah. Uh, so yeah, so just like, if you, if you wanna laugh, <laughs> that's a cool thing to do. <laughs> that's my first ask, I mean, <laughs> just laugh. Um, and the second ask, let's see, okay. Um, I like doing this on stage because like, I don't like preparing when I don't have to. I like coming out here and being like, okay, what should the audience do? All right, last, mm, actually, so I'm not allowed to go down there because like I don't have a mask, but like I, I tested and stuff like that. But does anyone have like a fun thing that they want to do as an audience, like a fun sound they want to make? What was that? <laughs> Laughing? <laughs> Clapping. <laughs> Clapping. Ah, that's basic. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Can we, like, come on. We, like, we cry, like, we went, wah. Like, come on, sky's the limit. The wave? I love it. Oh my God. Are we like, do you, again, this isn't my idea. This is a <laughs> person's idea, but can I see you all do a wave? Like we'll start, we'll start the front and then we'll make our way to the back. Can I just, oh, Catrice is going to film this. So, you know, you got to get it in order. Okay. First of all, we all know what the wave is, right? It's the Okay, yes, yes. Okay, I will, I will count you down, ready? Are we ready? And remember, a wave is like a ripple. Like if we all do it at the same time, I am gonna make us do it again and again until well, 7 p.m. and we have to go. All right, I'm gonna count down from three and then we'll start here and then make our way to the back. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh my God, this is amazing. Oh my God, woo! That was so good. That was so good. I am like, is there a way, like, can you guys see yourself on the screen? Is there a way for them to watch themselves do the wave? Like, can you aim? <laughs> is that too much? Am I like making this too difficult if you were to aim the cameras at the audience? so that they could watch themselves do the wave. Yeah, I can't see and I'm not allowed down there. So I'm just gonna trust. 
I'm going to trust. Wait, you guys can see yourselves? Oh, I love this. Okay, ready? It's going to be good. Starting from the front. We'll do it. Okay, how do we feel if we did the wave like front to back, but then back to front? Oh, it might be chaotic. All right, let's just do front to back. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> Woo! Oh my God, amazing. Thank you so much for that. Like, this is one of the things that, like, I'm on my deathbed. I'm just like, one time at the Kennedy Center, I made people do the wave. <laughs> Cool. Um, <laughs> all right. So, give it up. God, I should have done all of this before I read her biography. <laughs> all right, everyone, give it up for Devine Kerr. Hello, hello, thank you. Gorgeous crowd. Oh my gosh, she made you guys do the wave. Asian American voices making ripples. Woohoo! Make some noise for that. Hi. I feel so honored to be here uh, when they invited me to perform. I, I, I loved having the chance to reflect on what it meant to be Asian American um, in America. Well, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, growing up, I spent most of my time feeling like a big, empty, greasy pizza box. I never knew where I belonged, really. You know, like I was too oily for the recycling bin, but I didn't want to get trashed either. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> it, it was just like, where do I belong? You know, and, and you know, obviously just by looking at me, you can tell that I'm French Canadian, right? <laughs> and also American, and also Cambodian. <laughs> so in the late 70s, my family fled a totalitarian regime, and we found refuge in Canada, and we escaped the genocide on a bicycle, all four of us, I was wrapped in a blanket against my mother's chest, you know, and with easy access to breastfeeding. Every year we reenact that as a family tradition. <laughs> so Canada welcomed us and we all were crammed, like my uncles, grandma, grandpa, parents, everybody was crammed in a small, tiny little apartment. And uh, I used to hear my grandma say, you know, when there is love, there's room for 500 people, but when you hate each other, our country is not big enough to fit both. <laughs> but because of that, all my relatives were there. I never got my parents to myself, you know? And then when my uncles finally got married, they needed arranged marriages. <laughs> but um, when they finally got married, I got my parents to myself and I was excited, but then I lost them to retail hours. My parents bought an inconvenience store. And then I had to work there too, and it was inconvenient. They never had anything, you know? And, and that store, it was like a mullet in reverse. Like a lot of fun in the front, but with a lot of trauma in the back. <laughs> and it was interesting because there was a lot of like people on welfare who would come and talk down on my mother and be like, mm, you immigrant, go back to your country, you know? Ah. Oh. You're just a bunch of chinks who don't speak English or French. And my mom, it never faced her because she just had that Mona Lisa cryptic face. Like. <laughs> because she was thinking about her nice mansion in Cambodia before the war while we had servants and a helicopter. And we were well off before that tragedy happened. And that's another thing. That's another stereotype. You know, when people think about Cambodians, they always think about people missing limbs and, you know, killing field. People always come to me like, oh, sorry, honey, you know, I've seen everybody getting killed, your people. And I'm like, there was a nice Cambodia before the war. And, and you know, people are like, upper class Cambodia? Never heard of that. What the heck is this, you know? And growing up, my parents were really strict because they were trying to like, it's competing with me on the stage, I'm sorry. <laughs> growing up, my parents were very strict. I was raised by like some Amish Cambodians. I couldn't date, I couldn't do anything, you know, so I had to like strategize, you know, like across the street there was this boy named Adam Peterson. If you're watching Adam from Facebook, hey, now you know I had a crush on you. <laughs> he was half Chinese, half German, so I thought it was a safe bet. That means my parents would approve of him because he's Asian. And also, it meant also, well, I thought it would mean that he wouldn't have an Asian fetish. There was something I was worried about, like every time I would see white dudes being with me, I'm like, are you really, really f with me or is it because you think I'm Pocahontas, you know? Like. But then later on, I end up 
dating a, a French guy, and I was disappointed he didn't have a baguette. <laughs> I'm like, he's not your fetish, Devine. He's not your fetish. But you know, I really couldn't date much. Um, and I didn't date much either, because I, I think I sent off that vibe, like, if you come near me, my father's going to cut your wiener and feed it to the dogs. <laughs> it, it, was, um, it was something, you know. Growing up, I didn't really see any other Cambodians, you know, aside from my house or the temple. I don't know where they were. At school, there were no Cambodians. And then some friends would tell me, like, why don't you go hang out with the other nerdy Asians? And I'm like, the Chinese from Hong Kong and the Vietnamese, they're all into Anne Rice or Winnie the Pooh. And all my white friends were into like spin the bottle and raves. I was into hoping I had a white mom to make me a Canadian shepherd's pie. You know? <laughs> I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. I was that greasy pizza box. And so I, I hid in the art studio. That's where I discovered fine arts and I would do a lot of paintings. And to get like high scores, I would put a little red dot on a painting and just say, this is the blood of my people. And then I get 100% each time. <laughs> you know. And, um, you know, growing up also, like, well, at school, for example, you know, every, for some reason, my parents put me in all Catholic school from elementary to college. And every time there was a, a religious class, like catechism, they would pull my desk and put it in the hallway. And I would ask my dad when I came back home, like, why did they take me out? Like, how come I can't be in that class? And he said, because you're not a Catholic. And I said, what are we? Crickets. There's a lot of crickets in an Asian household. They, my, my family never explained to me, you know, they would just give me that death stare when I did something inappropriate. Like, like I would be like at a temple and I would like sit inappropriately and I would flash the Buddhist monk by accident, you know, because like, you have to like do the mermaid thing when you cross your leg to the back so that you always have your lady like legs. And my mom would threaten me like that. And, but I, I, she didn't give me an employee handbook to become the best Cambodian in the world, you know. She always said like, remember your roots. And I said, well, it would be easy to know my roots if I knew which plants I was dealing with, you know. Instead, I was just tripping on the roots on the ground and being clumsy about how to be Cambodian. But um, I, found that I finally became the perfect Cambodian to my parents when I married my Cambodian husband here. <laughs> yes, and um, people always look at us and think we're an arranged marriage, you know. Like, I bet she's family bought her for three herds of pandas. <laughs> I'm like, no, oh, his family's not that rich, <laughs> you know. Like, I don't know. And then it, that's, that's what brought me here to DC, right? So when I, when I moved here, I had to learn a whole new set of stereotypes. You know, it, it's funny when you cross the border, because I did not know that the US was linking Cambodians to donut shops. You know, like in Canada, we didn't have enough Cambodians to have a stereotype. <laughs> so when I got here, um, yeah, he <laughs> got two kids. Surprise, they're Asian also. And, uh, you know, that it was something to move to the U.S., you know. And, and I, I wish, though, the, I, I noticed American, Cambodian Americans are a lot more patriotic. They're very proud to be Cambodian, especially this new generation. And I, I envy them. I wish I blossomed earlier in, in my life. But I think it's because, you know, they have TikTok and they can go write, like, hashtags, like, Pro Cambodian pride, Cambodian, and, you know, like, and I'm... I didn't have that growing up. I didn't have Google or the internet. I couldn't like Google, why did my mom whip my butt with incense sticks? You know, like, <laughs> I did not know, like, you know, I've never seen any other Cambodians, you know, also like, plus, you know, when I went to school, my friends were always like, ew, I hope you have sexual experiences, Devine. And I'm like, but then my culture was that you better not have any sexual experience. <laughs> you know, your value in the market will go down. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, but, um. My parents worked hard enough, you know, like they had a single family home and we were well enough, you know, we were, well, we were comfortable enough to go to send me to private school and but not rich enough to go see a play at the Kennedy Center or eat at a food court for no reason at all. That we couldn't do, you know, and I, I was also embarrassed like my friends when they come over to my house, you know, they would sit on the couch and watch TV sideways like, why is your couch facing the lemongrass plant, you know, like. We had a different sense of aesthetics in my parents' house, you know, like, but, um, oh my God, I'm bombing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I have to be clean because the kids are there. Hi, children. There they are. <laughs> you know, um, being alone here, it's really hard. I, I put a lot of pressure on myself to, like, transmit my, 
Cambodian heritage to my children, you know? Like, it's hard to transmit the language. I'm a, I, I feel like I never do enough, right? It's, it's very difficult. But, um, but the other day, though, I was feeding my husband some mac and cheese, and, you know, I told him, I'm like, you're probably tired. He's very Americanized, by the way. Like, so, like Rebecca said, like, 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 like a Twinkie. Like, they, they do call us like that, you know, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. But um, him being very Americanized, I told him, I said, you're probably very, like, tired of eating all that Cambodian ethnic food, you know, because I grew up on fermented fish. I didn't care about food poisoning. We had free health care in Canada, you know. <laughs> and I told him, I said, I'm going to make you mac and cheese, you know, to just give you a break, you know, so for my American husband and my youngest scream, Mama, stop that. Papa's got roots, you know. And when I heard that, that really gave me a lot of hope. That was my time. My name is Devine Kerr. Thank you so much, you guys. Give it up one more time for Devine. Woo! Can I get all the performers on stage, please? Yeah, you. <laughs> now I'm not going to make you do anything. Give it up for the storytellers! Woo! All right, are you all ready for the grand reveal of our theme? It's like this whole time, if you just like Googled Asian Pacifica Arts Collective, you it, it would have popped up. Uh, so the theme is redefining ourselves. So tonight, we redefined ourselves. Y'all walked in with one idea of Asian Americans, and y'all are leaving with another. Maybe. I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to the Kennedy Center for having us. Um, we made you no money tonight because this was a free event, but <laughs> we would love to be back. And uh, our co-executive uh, director, Catrice Tipon, is right here. Give it up for her. And then give it up for yourselves because this was just so lovely. Oh, so good, so good. Thanks. All right, um, I guess it's time for the musical about the broken arm. So everyone, we are going to be back there. If you feel like talking to us, we can take a picture real quick. Do we have? Nope. She said no. <laughs> she said leave. All right, everybody, go. Leave. Clap on your way out. <laughs>